Good day everyone, my name is Phoebe Pura and I'll be presenting the third paper entitled J. Perkness and H. Solberg on the Life Cycle of Cyclones and Polar Front Theory of Atmospheric Circulation. So this was written by Alfred Henry from Weather Bureau, Washington, D.C. and it was published in 1922. Before we start, here are the things that we should know about the paper. So even though it was written by Alfred, um, the theories and models were actually developed by this two Norwegian meteorologists, namely Jacob Berkness, aka Jack, and Halvor Solberg. So they are both from Bergen School of Meteorology, which was headed by Dr. Wilhelm Berkness, which is also the father of Jacob, and he's a very influential man in meteorology due to his contributions and discoveries in this field. He's also the um, assistant of Heinrich Hertz in the discovery of electromagnetism. And aside from that, he actually um, founded the, the Geophysical Institute at the University of Bergen. Basically, this paper is focusing in Norwegian cyclone model, which is associated with a lot of names, such as the extratropical cyclones, mid-latitude cyclones, and the wave cyclones. So they were able to discover this during and after the World War I, which occurred in 1914. And currently, or this year, um, the Norwegian Cyclone Model paper celebrates its centennial anniversary since it was published at the winter of 1919 to 1920. Okay, so let's move on to the history of the paper, which is also um, focusing in the impacts of World War I to this theories. So what happened in World War I is actually most of the students or students of the Bergen School were actually called to service to fight for World War I. And one of the students of Dr. Wilhelm, Herbert Petzold, his name is Herbert Petzold, is a promising doctorate student of Dr. Wilhelm uh, who died at the battle, battle in Verdun. So I'm mentioning this because he actually studying, he was actually studying the um, air masses and their interaction along convergence lines. So Dr. Wilhelm is reviewing that paper at that time. So what, uh, when he died, what happened is um, Jack took over the study and he, were ab he was able to, um, to associate or he learned that it is actually connected to the formation of cyclones, which later on resulted in an original cyclone model. So aside from that, uh, because of World War I as well, Jack adopted the terminology from the Great War, which is the frontal weather, um, wherein he compared the interaction between air masses to the trench warfare being fought between allies and central powers. This building is the Bergen School of Meteorology. So I'm mentioning this because this school produced a lot of uh, great minds in meteorology that uh, they provided a lot of contributions as well that we are still using right now. All right, so before we move forward, let me also introduce you to these two Norwegian meteorologists who discovered these theories and has greatly influenced today's weather forecasting, even with a limited resources. First man is Halvor Solberg. He's an Norwegian meteorologist who was born in Ringsaker and Ringsaker is a uh, municipality in Norway by the way. Um, he's also a member of Bergen School of Meteorology and he worked at Christiana uh, from 1918 as a meteorologist. His thesis about, is about integrations of the atmospheric perturbation 
equations and he was also appointed professor at University of Oslo from 1930 to 1964. And lastly, at 1930s, when he worked on the theory of tides, atmospheric waves, and oscillation stability of gas and liquid flow. So we were able to um, associate this as well to this jury. Mm, so this second man is the um, no other than Jacob Burtness. He is the Norwegian American meteorologist who discovered that cyclones or the low pressure centers originate as waves. So the same reason why Norwegian um, cyclone model is also called as wave cyclones. So he associated this with sloping weather fronts that separate different air masses. So, which proved to be a major contribution to weather forecasting. He was only um, 19 years old when he, was, when he first published his scientific paper when he was assisting his father, Wilhelm Bergnes. And two years later, he published his groundbreaking study on the structure of low-pressure system, revolutionizing weather forecasting at that time. And until now, actually. So, Berkness and America. Because in 1939, he was invited to a lecture. So, he went together with his family to U.S. But unfortunately, they were not able to return because the war broke out already. And during his stay in U.S., he was offered by the U.S. Army or Air Force to lead a new school for training Air Force uh, weather officers um, where he actually trained 1,000 meteorologists in that um, school. During uh, his work as well, he was able to advance accuracy of aviation forecast. And one of his major contributions in meteorology is in 1966, he published his findings on what we know about the El Nino Southern um, Oscillation or ENSO. Alright, so the paper topic, like I mentioned, it's about the J. Uh, the um, J. Berkness and H. Holberg on the life cycle of cyclones and polar front theory of atmospheric circulation. So, um, like I mentioned as well, this is a uh, extension paper of this one because um, the life cyclones and polar front theory of atmospheric circulation was published as well in 1922 but it's just a copy of the manuscript but original one is at winter of 1919 to 1922 okay so what is the paper about first it's about the origin and maintenance of cyclones and anti-cyclones Second, the principal feature of cyclones, and then the stages on the life cyclone, uh, the life cycle of cyclones, and also the polar front theory and secondary cyclones. It also talks about the family of cyclones, and lastly, the, uh, the general extratropical circulation of the atmosphere. This paper also highlights the following. First, the essential conditions for the per, uh, formation of cyclones of cold air and warm air masses adjacent to each other. Second, cyclones are formed along lines of discontinuity which separate masses of dense polar air from lighter air or tropical origin. And then lastly, the source of energy for general circulation of the atmosphere lies in the contrast of temperature between the polar and equatorial regions. So, with that being said, um, I'd like to share this video about how the um, cyclones were being formed. So, what happened before that? So, let me uh, play this. By the way, this is from Dr. Uh, David Schultz from University of Manchester. To give you a global perspective on where extratropical cyclones occur, consider the following image. We are looking at infrared radiation emitted by the Earth 
but viewed by a satellite placed 35,000 kilometers above the equator. The satellite has an instrument that detects infrared radiation and converts it into a gray shading from black, which are the highest temperatures, to white, which are the lowest temperatures. So white areas represent high clouds, mostly cirrus and deep convective storms. Black areas, on the other hand, are the Earth's surface in the tropics, and light gray areas represent the tops of low clouds or cooler land surfaces. When we put these images in motion, several aspects are very clear. First is a band of persistent convective storms along the equator. This is called the intertropical convergence zone and is caused by the rising warm air in the tropics. North and south of the intertropical convergence zone in the subtropics are darker regions on these images. These regions are relatively cloud free and are associated with the desert regions of the world. These regions are associated with large scale descending motion, which is why they tend to be relatively free of clouds. At the surface, we find regions of high pressure, the so-called subtropical high pressure systems. Poleward of the subtropical highs lay the mid-latitude regions in both hemispheres. The mid-latitudes are characterized by relatively strong flow from west to east above the surface of the earth called the jet stream. Within the jet stream, disturbances form that we call mid-latitude cyclones. These are regions of low pressure and they have circulations that uh, as a result tend to evolve these comma-shaped cloud patterns seen here and here. Winds around these mid-latitude cyclones blow around the low counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. These cyclones tend to move along with the jet stream from west to east with the comma shape becoming more pronounced and wrapped up as the cyclone evolves. The jet stream forms along the strong gradient in temperature between cold polar air and warm tropical air in each hemisphere. Thus, the jet stream also is a manifestation of the strong gradient in temperature. So, poleward of the jet stream, the air tends to be cold, and equatorward of the jet stream, the air tends to be relatively warm. This temperature gradient is where our story begins. Okay, so earlier, it was mentioned um, something about the uh, jet stream, right? And as a matter of fact, there are two kinds of major jet stream. One is the subtropical jets, and the other one is the polar front jets. So what is a polar front jet? Basically, it occurs over a mid latitudes and strongly influences the weather over the uh, over UK and Europe. And it's a type of thermal wind that arises due to strong temperature contrast between cold polar air and warm tropical air. Or in other words, polar, uh, polar front theory, which is the transition as well, uh, or the region of transition which separates warmer tropical air from colder polar air in the mid latitudes. So if we can recall the highlights earlier of the paper, um, it talks about a line of discontinuity and a temperature contrast. So, um, if we can remember in the video, it explains the temperature gradient as well, which is, I believe, um, it's referring to the polar front theory, or another one is, it's also called as the stationary front. Okay. Um, by the way, this is this illustration of the life cycle of cyclones. So it undergo different stages and first one is um, there is an oppositely directed currents. One coming from east or the easterly and the one coming from west uh, or the warm westerly. And this is these are also, uh, actually separated by a straight boundary which like we mentioned um, that's the uh, discontinuity line or the temperature gradient itself. Okay, or the polar front, and another one is it's the stationary front. In the next step, 
um, it talks about uh, the place where the new cyclone is to be formed. Okay, this one is originally straight boundary, but just out toward the cold side. So, what do you think um, is the reason that um, a, an air here or an air parcel here um, bulges out? Okay, we're uh, here. Um, so, the reason why is uh, due to surface low pressure, uh, which was caused by the rising air. Okay. Because, as you can see, um, since it already uh, rises, or some air, warm rises, um, so if you can remember, um, warm air rises, right? And then the cold air or cold front is way denser. So that's why it has the ability to go um, here or in the left because for example if the replacement air comes from north it will be on the left side forming a cold front so this is where the cold front is being formed and then it will continue uh, on that process until it become more uh, prominent here and then after that or in letter C it talks about that the tongue of warm air is identical with warm um, sector of the cyclone here. And the ascending air from this warm tongue forms the warm front. Okay, so warm front is, uh, will be here. And the cold front, okay, so like we mentioned, the cold front will be here in the left. So this newly formed cyclone follows the current and warm air eastward and is propagated as a wave on the uh, boundary surface between warm and cold air. So as you can see, it forms a wave shape or a structure. So the same reason like again, uh, that's why it's called as a wave cyclone. Okay, so, so by the way, like I mentioned earlier as well, um, from... If the air or the replacement air is coming from uh, north, it will be on the left side. But uh, for the replacement air from the south or the warm air, it will be, of course, in the right side because of uh, their movement. Okay, in letter C as well. During the eastward motion, the amplitude of the warm wave increases in horizontal north to south direction as in. Um, and for the next step, wherein there is already a cold air curves around the northern end. So as you can see, okay, it, this is the cold air that curves around the warm air. And it arrives in the rear or the back of the cyclone. So there's a movement or circular, circular motion already. And this type corresponds to the previously described ideal cyclone. So this is the what they call this ideal cyclone, as they mentioned, which is simultaneously with the further increase in amplitude. And the tank of the warm air narrows. Narrows. Here, it narrows down laterally, especially in the southern part of the cyclone. And if this continues uh, and has enough intensity, uh, okay, um, in letter E, by the way, there is a cold air from rear, right? This one. And then that cuts off the warm of the warm air. By the way, um, the reason why it's more prominent in the cold air because, uh, I mean the cold front because as we know, um, cold air is denser than the warm air. So it has the ability to go to the other side. So as you can see from here to this one, so it has the um, more of the uh, movement than the warm air because uh, warm air is less denser and the cold air is less denser. That's why it was the one it was the one who adjusted or adjusted in this motion. And letter E um, called 
I mean, in... So, this one is the secluded um, cyclone. And like I mentioned, in, if this continues as well um, and has already gathered enough intensity, um, it will form the occluded front. Um, occluded front is actually when the cold front overpowered the warm front. So, this is the remaining part of the warm sector. Uh, near the center also soon disappears so that the cyclone on the ground consists of cold air only occluded cyclone so this one is already the occluded cyclone and then <clears throat> at the place where the warm sector disappeared a borderline a borderline persists for some time between the cold air from the rear and front of the cyclone and in this part, the boundary also um, disappears and the cyclone becomes a, rarely, a nearly uh, symmetrical vortex of cold air. So, it's um, doing this motion or circling motion and then... Um, soon enough, because it's trapping the air in the ground and it will, um, it will be dissipated soon. So, like this in letter H. Because the large zones of continuous rain have then uh, disappeared and precipitation occurs. Only as intermittent showers, these conditions then persist until the cyclone is wasted away. Because, um, if we can recall, um... Our preview subjects about meteorology as well, or this uh, formation of cyclone. Um, cyclone as actually is gathering its power in warm water, but if it's already, uh, especially if it already landed in the ground, um, it will be, um, they call that, slowly dissipating because it's already, uh, for example, it has no battery anymore, or something like that. Okay, so earlier I've been mentioning different types of fronts. So these are something like a review because it's really important, especially in this cyclone. Although it wasn't shown in the paper, be, it, probably because it's still a uh, way back, right, older paper. So in this one, this is the stationary front. So I believe or I learned that this is the... Um, this continuity line or the polar front that they are telling as well and this blue triangular with line as well is the cold front and then this one is the warm front and lastly the occlu occluded front okay so okay and this man, which is Tor Bergeron, he is the one responsible for all those front symbols and other weather symbols. Um, he were able to develop this bef after the, you know, the, this, the model for the Norwegian cyclones. And then aside from that, okay, sorry. Um, like I mentioned, he proposed the symbols currently used for different types of fronts and air masses. And he also developed 3D representation by which a cold front and warm front emerge, resulting in the previously sandwiched, previously sandwiched warm air being called, being lifted aloft or above. So, Bergeron called this occluded region. So, uh, like this one. Okay. So, earlier we were talking about this. So, like I mentioned, there is a discontinuity line or the temperature gradient. And this is the stationary front, which is, from its name itself, stationary or not moving. And then this is the easterly uh, front. I mean, easterly, because it came from the east going to the west. <laughs> okay. And then west... Uh, Westerly. So, this is the 3D representation that um, Bergeron is talk, um, talking about. 
Okay, so basically, here are the fronts. And there you go. Another, uh, this is the time where waveforms different. So, this is, um, like I mentioned, uh, because of the rising air, there will be a surface low pressure here. And then, the tang will bulge. Okay. And then eventually producing the cold front and the warm front. So this is okay. And as we can see in the arrow, cold air goes down and then the warm air goes up. So I also happened to see an experiment before. Um, if there's a aquarium, an aquarium, and you put warm water and cold water, but for us to be able to distinguish which one is the warm and what uh, the cold one, I can put, for example, coffee on the cold water. And then if you pour them, and there's a separation first or boundary first, and then if you remove the boundary, um, cold water will be going down, and then the warm water will be uh, going up. So it's like the slope this one so it will show this um, scenario okay so next is this um, showing that the, uh, the wave already intensified so this overhead view and this is also the in uh, 3d view of the wave so and this is also showing that um, cold is um, overpowering the warm front okay so at that time since um, cold air is denser and it's still moving to the warm front they were they will be um, from somehow merge or over, over, overpowered warm front so this one will produce the occluded front this purple or the violet one okay and then this is the mature or low pressure system by the way and okay this is the 3d view of that and then lastly after um, all the rain already uh, was gone uh, this is already dissipating so there you go and since there will always be cold and warm uh, temperature in our globe or our earth um, this process will be continued um, every time but it doesn't necessarily uh, the case because still there's still a lot of requirements that it will be needed for this um, also I'd like to share so we know that um, weather is due to an even distribution so somehow cyclones are nature's way for um distributing this uneven dis uh, i mean uneven weather or temperature but um i guess is uh, the nature is not that successful that's why the cyclones are being formed okay So uh, let's move on to the formation of secondary cyclone with seclusion of primary cyclone. So this is the time where new cyclones uh, formed on thermal surfaces which run through an existing primary uh, place. Because for example, there's already a typhoon here, I mean a cyclone here. Um, if it will uh, continue and intensifies, there is a chance for another cyclone so it's like a uh, breathing of for a secondary cyclone from the major cyclone or the primary cyclone so as you can see formation may take place either what is showing in figure two and three so this is the figure two i believe but the most common in figure is figure three so this is the northward inflection by the way because it's the dashes is going north um, some distance in the primary cyclone then then there you go and then so 
so like I mentioned the more common one is like this so this is uh, easy or I mean more uh, often times that a secondary cyclone is being formed so it's something like a lateral um, formation so it's moving um, example east so on, on for um, there's a chance as well for another second or an, for the secondary cyclone to be formed here so it's like a baby cyclone as well okay So this one, excuse, so like I mentioned earlier, there will always be a discontinuity line or temperature gradient, especially um, for um, areas near uh, the polar region and the tropical region. So there's a, there are chances that there will be a series of cyclones. Like, um, for example, what's happening right now, I'm not sure if it's associated because it's siphons, so obviously, but um, this one, so there's, a, there's always going to be a chance that there will be a series of cyclones because of the discontinuity and the, I mean, discontinuity line or the um, interaction between warm and cold air. So these are the cyclone family. So if if it happened that um, okay, so this is where each family begins with the first cyclone traveling along a track north. There we go. And of that preceding cyclone and ends with the cyclone traveling so far south that it brings the polar air down to the trade wind system. All cyclones of one family are thus formed on one and the same polar front. Moreover, each new family is formed on another uh, polar front or uh, not connected with each other. Uh, with either the polar front and the foregoing following cyclone families. When such a cyclone pass, family passes, usually for individual cyclones are observed from a, a fixed place, uh, centrally within considerably from one family to another. Okay, so there you go. This one also is the general extratropical circulation of the atmosphere. So uh, we've been we've been talking about the contrast of temperature because definitely that will always be uh, one of the um, source of energy for the general circulation of atmosphere. So especially between the polar and equatorial regions. So the system of the motion, which is comprised under the name general circulation, tries to smooth. The contrast by bringing polar air to tropical region and vice versa so um, there is this uh, it happens that the circulation or the general atmospheric circulation tends to bring the polar air to equatorial air and then because I mean vice versa like I mentioned because it's always gonna be the way of nature for um, solving the uneven balance in our temperature so they describe the principal features of the cyclone and consisting of two essentially different air masses, the one of cold, the other of warm origin. So another one is the two air masses are separated by a fairly distinct boundary surface which runs through cyclones and which the authors believe may continue more or less distinctly through the greater part of the troposphere. Being everywhere inclined toward the cold side, small angle at horizontally say 1 or even 0 0.1 uh, degrees. In the northern hemisphere as well, the warm air is conveyed by a southwesterly or westerly current on the southern side of the depression. And at the front of this current, the warm air ascends the wedge of all uh, their air and gives rise to precipitation, warm front rain. 
Lastly, the warm current is simultaneously attacked on its flank by cold air masses from the rear of the cyclone. So the part of the warm air is lifted and precipitation is formed called front train. So these are the example of the general circulation. So this comma is the formation of the cyclone. So there's about one, two, three. So I'm not sure actually. So there you go. Um, here are also the strengths and weaknesses of the paper. So for the strength, like we mentioned, it is a breakthrough in weather forecasting um, since it very um, essential for us to be able to understand how cyclones are being formed. And also, it's very inspiring because at that time, as we all know, they just use the surface-based observations. They don't have any um, technological uh, data like satellites or computer or anything, but just the observations that they have. So how much more um, what we can discover because we already have those resources right now and like them. But it's really great because it is really uh, it really revolutionized the weather forecasting at that time and today of course and also it is mostly laymanized so most of the words were understand but however for the weakness i i'd like to say that um it lacks labels in the figures probably because the weather friends I mean, the symbols are not yet discovered at that time, so it is um, years after that, after Bergeron uh, uh, formulated those symbols. And then some terms are, and graphs were not explained properly because apparently, like I mentioned, this is just an extension paper um, of Solberg and um, Berkness. Yeah, there you go. So for the next steps, um, we can use available data and resources from satellites and other technology that we have right now. Also, uh, probably describing features such as its size, duration, its vertical or cross-sectional appearance during the formation. But then again, um, I guess for this extension paper, um, it's also better if he have this. So that we can you know visualize it even better so lastly um, compare with formation of cyclones or typhoons in other locations so um, just wanted to know if there is differences of how cyclone I mean cyclones form and typhoons and hurricanes especially they are in different locations in the globe so they are different in temperature and other air mass or something like that and then lastly, additional information. So, um, higher temperature will cause stronger cyclones, as we all know, because it's from a source of energy is really uh, coming from warm water, right? So, if there's going to be warmer water, warmer temperature in the future, uh, like what we read before in the climate change, it will definitely cause stronger cyclone, cyclones. And then also there are different types of cyclones as well. And they are measured in wind and falling into different types uh, depending on its uh, category. So like I mentioned, these are the types of cyclones. It has the extratropical cyclone, which what we talked earlier, subtropical cyclone, tropical cyclone, uh, hurricanes and typhoon and tropical depression tropical storm and then uh, they also have the polar cyclones and Shapiro Kaiser cyclone which is a step special type of extratropical cyclone lastly the BAM cyclone it's the pressure uh, when the pressure drops at least 24 uh, millibars in 24 seconds so the lower the pressure the higher the intensity of the cyclone and then the BAMB anti-cyclone pressure rises at least 6 um, millibars in 24 hours so it's when it became high so anti-cyclone so from its name itself and yeah thank you so much and hope you have clear skies